The following podcast contains explicit language. Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. December 15th, 2022, the Is Cinema Toast edition. I'm David Plotz of CityCast in Washington, D.C. It is a gray and dreary day here in Washington, D.C. But there's always sunshine in my life because shining radiantly from New York City is John Dickerson of CBS Primetime. Hello, John Dickerson. You know, if Kirsten Cinema ran in France, she'd be Cinema French Toast. Cinema Verite. And then... Also, a beacon, a beacon of warmth and gladness in the darkness that is impending winter is Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School from Philly today. Hello, Emily. Hello. So glad to be in Philadelphia. This week on the GabFest, what does it mean that Republicans actually won the popular vote in November and pretty handily? Then, how will Kirsten Sinema's defection affect the Senate and how will it affect the 2024 election? And how will it affect Arizona? Then we will use a fascinating new documentary about Nancy Pelosi to assess her legacy. Plus, of course, we'll have cocktail chatter. This episode of the Gab Fest is sponsored by Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Myrtle Beach, South Carolina is the beach. It's also the perfect place to enjoy the holidays. Here you get all the holiday cheer you can handle, plus 60 miles of beaches and endless fun. It's a gray day where I am, a gray and drizzly day, and I can imagine the pleasure of celebrating the holidays, bringing in the new year with an ocean view, blue skies, warm weather. This time of year in Myrtle Beach is great for horseback riding along the shoreline, for fishing from chartered boats or in intracoastal waterways, and golfing at any of the 80-plus award-winning courses. So take a holiday from the average holiday season at the beach. Plan your getaway to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina at visitmyrtlebeach.com. So comes data from the election this week, primarily in the form of a long article by Emily's New York Times colleague, Nate Cohn, that Republicans won the popular vote in 2022 pretty handily. The narrative has been what a win for the Democrats. They just narrowly lost the House, held the Senate with room to spare, uh, with cinema asterisk next to it. And uh, took some governor's races, took some state legislatures back. But it turns out that if you add up all the votes, uh, Republicans won by two points. So, John, did we get the whole story wrong? Was this, in fact, a good election for Republicans and and uh, and the media has been misunderstanding it? No, it, they should have won more races. They didn't win as many races as they should have. That's why it's a bad election for them. It is it is interesting in in figuring out the vote um, that it's why that happened. And it wasn't because Republicans didn't turn out um, in, in those key Senate races in particular. They turned out they just voted for the other candidate because it turns out if you pick people who are wholly so unqualified that um, that it's an embarrassment that voters, even in your own party, will go vote for the other side. So what we learned there is that there is that split ticket voting is still alive, although I think the data um, show that it's alive, but only in those extreme circumstances that you really have to run a Mehmet Oz or a Herschel Walker um, to get uh, or a Blake Masters, particularly Blake Masters and and uh, Carrie Lake, actually, um, to to get to get voters who are partisans to switch over and vote for the other for the other team. But um, I think one thing where it is interesting, um, it doesn't change the overall results, but it is interesting as Republicans try to figure out what their challenge is, why they didn't do better in a year where the president was unpopular, the economy was bad, um, and historical trends would have suggested much bigger victories in the House, why they didn't do well. Some Republicans have tried to say, well, we we should focus more on mail-in ballots, we should focus more in, on early voting, all of which undermines Donald Trump's view about those things, but nevertheless. But what this analysis shows is actually that's not that's not the problem. Voters, there was a robust turnout for Republicans. So maybe the problem is um, uh, the kinds of candidates that ran in those key races. I didn't understand, John. So is the theory that Republicans piled up votes in the wrong places? 
Yeah. They piled up votes in places they were already going to win pretty handily in house rate in red red seat house races. Is that what it was? That's definitely true. So, for example, they did well in in Republicans turned out in the in the South where they were likely to win anyway. Um, the um, where it where. So that's one of the things is they piled up votes in uh, areas where they were going to win anyway. But they also the, the secondary finding is that while they piled up votes in some places in the in those key Senate races, they didn't pile up votes or they turned out, but they voted for the Democratic candidate. Emily, it must be alarming for Democrats, however, the extremely low turnout of black voters generally who are just the backbone of the Democratic Party. Is this just kind of the normal pattern of a midterm and, oh, not to worry? Or did it feel distinctive that there's something in in what's happening with the Democratic Party's relationship to black voters that, that they should be more concerned about? I mean, they should be concerned. And some of this drop off has been part of the electoral picture since President Obama left office. Um, I mean, I think it particularly looks like it might have mattered in Wisconsin, where the Democratic Senate candidate Mandela Barnes lost by something like 26,000 votes. And turnout was among black Democrats, or at least I think among Democrats in Milwaukee, which is a city in Wisconsin, was, I think, the drop off was even more around the same amount that um, Barnes lost. And so, look, I mean, all the people who didn't vote or who didn't vote for Barnes are, you know, get the credit or blame for how that election went. But you look at a gap like that and you think what was going on in Milwaukee that people were not interested. Um, he seemed like he should be a candidate that would play well. What's happening there? And, you know, I think the sort of broader question is, Obviously, it was really important in this election, and it it will remain important for Democrats to be able to persuade some registered Republicans or independents to vote for their candidates. Otherwise, they're not going to win. And then there's this question of whether when you try to persuade into what is probably a more moderate or, you know, even more conservative middle, are you losing the sort of core Democratic voters are there messages that appeal on both ends of that spectrum? I mean, maybe there are. And I haven't seen any really good explanations of why black turnout was down um, that are related to messaging or what the candidates did or didn't do. Have either of you seen any compelling explanations? I don't think we really know yet. Right, John? I haven't seen it. I mean, I've seen the the analysis that the, uh, you know, that the turnout was low. Um, one possible, and this is, I'm um, making this up on the fly, um, is that turnout in off-year elections is not, is often not robust. Um, the bigger question, the larger question this needs to be figured out for Democrats is that one of the most uh, crucial challenges for the party is it's increasing is is the fact that it's basically becoming a white educated party. And so if they're losing, losing some non white voters, and they're losing working white class voters, then then they're left only with college educated and the suburban vote uh, didn't rush back to the Re Republicans the way some had hoped. Um, again, in in crucial places where they had bad Senate candidates. But I mean, if you start losing some suburban college educated voters, the Democrats are, you know, their coalition looks pretty weak for 2024 in both the Senate um, and the presidential. It isn't true that this midterm was a low turnout midterm. This midterm was a pretty high turnout midterm. It's just that the, but bl for black Democrats, it was a low turnout, relatively low turnout. Midterm. Right. But you could, you could imagine the low turnout effects which are standard, um, just existing in one pocket or another. I mean, the, even if other even if other cohorts turned out, it does. It's it's not necessarily. There may be idiosyncrasies to individual groups that that are well unique to those groups. Can we go back to your point about education, John? Because that seems to me to be a tricky one. I mean, college educated voters may want more progressive messaging if they're Democrats than this larger base may be comfortable with, whether they're black or Latino or Asian or white, there can be a kind of divide there. And especially if a lot of the people who are working for Democratic politicians and on campaigns are also in that kind of highly educated, progressive sliver. And it just seems like something Democrats really need to keep an eye on. And there are lots of you know, discussions and fights about messaging and how broad to make it, how 
to settle on messages, you know, for example, about law enforcement and public safety that are not a total sellout of, you know, values of reducing um, reliance on punishment and incarceration, but that also resonate and make people feel like Democrats care about public safety. That's one I watch a lot. It's a fine point. I wonder whether that will be the animating conversation in 24, um, you, you know, or whether Democrats have basically um, moved past that and have already basically drawn a conclusion. If you look at the if 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 the conclusion is that Democrats did better because they weren't able to be successfully tagged as a wildly liberal party, um, which I think is one of the takeaways from this election, then um, re-embracing one of the top issues that was used to try to make the Democratic Party seem to be wildly liberal, which is the defund the police message, I think you'll probably have Democrats pretty consistently staying away from that. So I wonder what the the second um, set of issues will be. I mean, when you think about what Republicans were trying to do, was trying to get those suburban voters back by either doing a defund the police crime message or the education message. Um, that didn't work as well. Um, and, and obviously the economy too, but that's less um, that's less of a values issue. Um, and, and those three didn't have smashing successes for, for Republicans. Um, so I don't know what will work with that constituency next time around. Yeah. I mean, that's like the whole trans, trans terror groomer stuff feels like it didn't really play outside of pretty small Republican base. I mean, it was, it was very off putting to lots of other people. Uh, what did you guys make of this interesting, um, disparity the split in how latinos voted that seems to have happened that you had this move to the right in certain states notably texas and florida and then not so much in across the southwest in arizona new mexico nevada 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 i mean i think part of it is just that Latino is this term that covers all these different people from different countries. In Florida, it's easy to see the Cuban Americans moving to the right. They are not that similar to the Mexican and other Americans in these other states. Uh, so that's always one thing I think about is that we talk about this in a broad brush way, but actually the subgroups are important. And also just not where you're from, but how long you have been here, that the behavior of someone who's been here for a citizen for a year is very different than someone who's been a citizen generationally. Those families have been citizens. And so you'd expect it to be quite different. John, what do you think, just wrapping this up, what do you think is the story that Democrats should be telling themselves about how to build a coalition in 2024, given what they now know about the 2022 election, both for the presidential race and for the races in Congress and the state houses? It depends on who this, who's at the top of the ticket, because I think you basically back into your message based on the ability of the person at the top of the ticket to, to sell that message. Um, for example, you could imagine somebody saying, fresh new leadership. Well, that doesn't work if you've got a, if you got Joe Biden as the president. So so I think it's hot, heavily determined by that. Um, I think the negative I think one thing that certainly Democrats benefited from was the enthusiasm in their own ranks that was driven by Donald Trump um, and Trump associated thinking, which is say Donald Trump threats to democracy. That's the Trump associated thinking um, and then abortion. And all three of those things may be off the ballot um, in 24. And that'll matter. You know, negative partisanship drives a lot of voting. So um, um, you, if you're a Democrat, you want those things to be around. And so since they won't be, I think the biggest message is what what's going to replace that. Um I mean, obviously, standard old attacking the other side is fine, but but what's going to give you the animating um, power the next time around? And you're going to have some tough Senate races, um, you know, in Arizona, um, in Ohio, in Montana, in West Virginia, um, and there will be tensions between those Senate candidates who will have to run um, on the kind of messages that that were successful um, in Georgia, Pennsylvania, well, Georgia, Arizona, more kind of leaning to the independents and the middle, um, while at the same time, you're going to have, you know, potentially a Democratic primary, uh, if Biden doesn't choose to run, that could be, you know, a com competition for liberals. On the other hand, if Biden runs, he's more like those kinds of um, 
candidates who would be running in. So I don't know. Um, I, I think it's it really depends on what the makeup of, of who's running at the presidential level determines the the issue set. Slate Plus members. Woo. Thank you. You get bonus segments on the GabFest. Every week we do a bonus segment for Slate Plus members. If you go to slate.com slash GabFest Plus, you can become a member today. You also get lots of other goodies for being a member. Member exclusive episodes from shows like Slow Burn and Amicus and no ads on any podcasts and unlimited reading on the Slate site. This week's Slate Plus segment, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk through a few of the conundrums uh, that we've gotten from you. And we're really looking forward to our conundrum show in a couple of weeks. And so we'll talk through a couple of them in in eager anticipation for that. Go to slate.com slash GabFest plus to become a member today. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by GiveWell. When you give to a charity, how much impact will your donation actually have? This is a really hard, even impossible question to answer. Most charities can't tell you how your money will be used or how much good it will accomplish. You may know theoretically it could help a cause, but how, or more importantly, how much? If you want to help people living in poverty with evidence-backed, high-impact charities, check out GiveWell. GiveWell spends over 30,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest-impact, evidence-backed opportunities they've found. Over 100,000 donors, including me, have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. And using GiveWell's research is free. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. They publish all of their research and recommendations on their site for free, no sign-up required. They allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity or fund you choose without taking a cut. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org and pick Podcast and enter Political Gab Fest at checkout. Make sure they know you heard about GiveWell from the Gab Fest to get your donation matched. This episode of the Gab Fest is sponsored by Slotomania. What if you had a go-to game that could instantly bring a hefty dose of fun to your day whenever you needed it? Life is too short for a day without fun. Get a thrill whenever you need it with Slotomania, the world's number one free slots game. You're going to have endless excitement at your fingertips. They have 170 free-to-play slot games, huge jackpots, an interactive community, and a million free coins. It's the perfect escape from your daily routine. With Slotomania, you can get the thrill of slots from the palm of your hand. They have hundreds of original Vegas-style and video slot machines ready to play wherever you are. It's like a Vegas vacation without the luggage. You don't have to have insider knowledge or strategies, so you can start having fun right away. And they add new features daily, including fun mini games and your very own pet cheetah, Aurora. So when your day is feeling stale, just ask, what will today spin? If you're 21 or older, you can join millions of players around the world. Download Slotomania, the number one free slots game, on the App Store or Google Play Store and get 1 million free coins. That's Slotomania on the App Store or Google Play Store for 1 million free coins. Kirsten Cinema has left the Democratic Party in advance of a 2024 election when she will have to run, if she runs, in a state, Arizona, where Democrats are generally very irritated by her and irritated by her flirtation with Republicans and her occasional unwillingness to go along with the Democratic agenda. It sets up a very hairy election for Democrats in 2024. And I feel like there were, do you guys remember there was that meme in the Trump years, the Twitter meme, which was time for some game theory when people would do that, like time for some game. I feel like it's time for some game theory on what is happening with cinema and like what this, what this dynamic is. So Emily, why, why did cinema drop the democratic name tag now? It's not even clear she's going to stop voting with them or caucusing with them or, you know, having her nice committee assignments with them, but she dropped the name tag. I mean... I guess. Do I have to give her the benefit of the doubt? I I have a mini rant about this, which is like, okay. Bring it. So I be in whatever party you want. That is up to you. But this whole like, oh, I'm not even going to really make it clear. You know, it's such a DC thing to worry about whether they're 
are 51 Democratic senators and whether they get to control the committees. Like, no, you're a politician. This is the Senate. Which party has the majority in the Senate matters to a lot of people you work with. It should matter to you. And also to a lot of Americans, some of whom elected you. Like, it just, the sort of footsie with like politics doesn't matter and I'm independent and I'm not going to define what lasting change means. I'm just going to say I'm for it. I, it's, I find her so irritating on all of those fronts. So, I mean, the obvious answer for why she did this is that she's trying to spare herself a Democratic primary, which she might very well lose. And she looked at the fact that, you know, in Arizona, now other Democrats who are not so enigmatic have been elected. And she thought, I'm not going to be able to say that it has to be me. I'm This is the only way to win a seat. And so if I take myself out of the primary and I run as an independent, then Democrats will know that if they put out a candidate and there's a three-way race, it, the Republican could well win and they won't want to do that. And so that's the game theory here. Is it certain, John, that if there's a three-way race in Arizona with, with cinema and a Democrat and a Republican that that the Republicans win back that seat? Is it is it pretty certain, I should say? Um, there's not a lot of evidence to refute that theory, if I can um, uh, come at it in that sideways fashion. So cinema is not very popular. Um, and that's a problem. So if if there were three candidates, she might get some votes. Um, but, you know, obviously, Mark Kelly um, had a tough race in Arizona, and it's going to be a tough race for whoever the Democrat um, who runs uh, in the state is. And so they're going to need every vote they can get. And they wouldn't you don't want votes going um, to cinema that might go to the Democrats. So, it, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable assumption. Is she so unpopular that no Democrat would get that she'd get zero votes or she'd only get Republican votes? I don't think that's right. I mean, the question for Democrats is whether they um you know, how how much they would put behind a Democratic candidate, um, because it could just be a lot of money um, for a race that goes to a Republican. And in the, and in this really tough environment next time around, money's going to be tight. Um, on the other hand, you have um, I mean, the other dynamics in the state are obviously if you don't back an anti cinema Democrat um, fulsomely, then you then you are sending a national message at a time where you want every damn Democrat to turn out everywhere because it's a presidential year. Um, it's also possible, by the way, she doesn't run, and this is just post departure branding. I'm struck, though, in the state that's supposed to, uh, you know, love Mavericks. I mean, she certainly has done all the kinds of things to irritate her party that would be consistent with the Maverick definition as created under John McCain, and yet it doesn't seem to be getting her any. Popularity. Mark Kelly, on the other hand, um, was strategic, was um, um, and and was probably helped a little bit as some as a fair number of Democrats were, and you could maybe even argue a lot of Democrats were by Cinema holding up some of the legislation that didn't pass um, that might have made Democrats seem less wildly liberal, and then therefore helped them in twenty twenty two. So that's another side argument, but it's not an insane take. This whole Maverick thing is is kind of contingent on people like giving you a base of trust. And what McCain had, McCain had been a genuine American hero who had suffered enormously for his country. No one could gainsay that. And so you could always like you you could be irritated by him, but you couldn't be like this guy is a is a shyster and a fraud. Whereas with cinema, her whole life is she's a someone who spent in a constant quest for self-actualization or self-actualization i suppose it really is for fame glory attention there's been no there's no there seems to be no base there in her there's no fundamental who is cursed in cinema like who can we identify as this kind of cogent whole person who stands for something that's never seems to have existed and so it doesn't feel like she's a maverick it feels like she's completely uh she's completely fickle like I used to have a principle there when I when I when I was working more in digital media and when Yahoo was a thing like Yahoo was huge Yahoo was always a big deal in digital media and they had so much power and they had so much audience back this is back in like the mid 2000s and um, they would always have these deals where like a smaller site like Slate we could work with Yahoo and be such a great opportunity and 
it was always the case that whatever Yahoo did, like two weeks later, they would absolutely reverse it and completely fuck you. And I feel like Kirsten Sinema is like the, she's like the, the Yahoo of the Senate. Democrats should not make a deal with her. They should not make a deal with her because she's going to fuck them. Like, whatever happens, she will pick her, her path. And so they should, they should definitely not like roll over to make life good for her. They should, because she, what she'll do is she'll switch parties to the Republicans if it becomes opportunistic, if it becomes available to her in, in 2024 anyway. So why bother? Why yoke yourself to this person who, is, who will completely screw you and is untrustworthy? Well, at the moment, they're, they're not giving up her committee assignments. So they are not totally pushing her out of the boat, um, which seems to be wise because there's a lot of stuff you want to get done that she may not care about that they would benefit from her vote on. Right. I mean, I feel like they're being very sort of civil and kind of treating her delicately right now. What they have over her is running a Democrat, a really good Democratic candidate who would then compete in the election after the primary. I understand the impatience of the two party system in this country. I really get it. And and I think Bernie Sanders and Angus King have been effective as independents, whatever that meant has meant. Um but there is something that's just – she's so irritating. There's something which – it's just like you're untrustworthy. It's just people – people will deal with – right now, she gets fruit baskets. Right now, she gets invitations to the spa because everyone wants her. And that must be a nice feeling to be wanted. But ultimately, people know that she's just not someone you can trust. And that is not a pleasant reputation to have. It is not pleasant to be that person. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by Masterclass. Masterclass is amazing. Songwriting lessons from John Legend, the power of personal branding from Chris Jenner, Bob Iger teaching you business strategy, Gordon Ramsay teaching you cooking, but probably without the yelling, Neil Gaiman teaching the art of storytelling. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best artists, icons, and leaders anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to write anything from a book or a screenplay to just a letter. You can learn how to make a dinner worthy of a Michelin star with over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors that things you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. I am super excited to take a new class that Masterclass is offering called Crisis Day. It's three scenarios, a hostage negotiation, a critical threat in outer space, and 9-11. And you have three of the world's best minds handling these worst case scenarios. You have Condoleezza Rice, who worked through 9-11. Chris Hadfield, who dealt with a critical threat in outer space. And Chris Voss, a hostage negotiator. I'm really excited to learn from them as I was really excited to learn how to shoot a better jump shot from Steph Curry and how to, to craft my screenplay from Issa Rae. So this holiday, give the perfect gift of an annual Masterclass membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash GabFest today. That's masterclass.com slash GabFest. Terms apply. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. On HBO, there is now a really fascinating documentary, Pelosi in the House. Mom, why did you choose this life? I didn't really choose this life. It chose me. I put the picture of me and you there so that all my siblings can see I'm your favorite. For my entire adult life, I have been two steps behind you with this camera trying to keep up with you. I am a workhorse, not a show horse. I was born into a family that was fiercely patriotic and staunchly democratic. Politics was the life that we led. I have the high privilege as the first president to begin the State of the Union message with these words. Madam Speaker. It is a film about Nancy Pelosi, the exiting House Speaker. She's not retired from the House, uh, who has served the House 
and House Democrats so ably for almost 40 years. It's a film made by her daughter, Alexandra Pelosi, who's a, a noted filmmaker who's made other political movies before. And Alexandra Pelosi has had a camera on her mother at work for quite a long time. And this film is a, is a compilation of film that Alexandra gathered over many, many years without her mother's permission, really. I mean, I, I, don't, I think her mother realized that she was being filmed, but I don't think she, her mother was not like, let's make a film together. Um, and Alexandra has now strung it together. The, the, the major chapters in it being the two things, one, the passage of the Affordable Care Act in the Obama years. And then secondly, the, the events of January 6th and, the, and what happened afterwards. And those are the two large set pieces that, that kind of hold the movie together. Uh, we've all watched it. I really suggest that you watch it. it is a, it's a really fun watch. Um, but we're going to talk about it. So, Emily, what did you, uh, what was your, your overwhelming sense coming away from this? Did you have a, a phrase that was stuck, sticks with you or a feeling that sticks with you after watching Nancy Pelosi at work? You know, it reminded me of the Mitt Romney documentary in that both cases, there's this person who seems kind of far away and often speaks in these political platitudes and they don't seem super real or warm or someone like that you would enjoy spending time with. And then you see them in all their personal quirks. Like there's a great scene of her dancing around with her grandchildren and you see her kind of on the phone, like venting to President Obama about something after a vote. And just, it's just very human. And did you, you like, sorry to interrupt no. you for one second. Cause I've just, I just did when you started talking, I was just struck by this, that there's a scene when Mike Pence, there's a there's sort of a media pandemic meeting or something. <laughs> and Mike Pence is chairing it. And so she's has to be there. And she's just doing her laundry the whole time and like folding laundry, making the bed, cleaning the microwave. It's and then she at the end, she does this like nice little wrap up as though she's been paying attention. It was so great. That was awesome. I Yeah. All those moments, they just make you see her as this three dimensional human being who's like living her life. And. I really enjoy that about that's that is the kind of documentary I can get into where you feel like you're really seeing this person and they're a person. Lo and behold, we're all people. The two things that uh, that struck me about. I never really I've asked her a bunch of times. I asked John Boehner. I asked a lot of people about why she has been successful. And then uh, an adjacent question is why she's successful in handling um, her more fidgety members of her conference than Republicans are in handling their fidgety members. The short answer is Republicans have a bigger <laughs> number of fidgety people and their party is more driven by their um, ideological portion than the Democrats are. So, But she is also, and John Boehner says this, m just much tougher than he was. And yet there are only a couple of places in the in the movie where you see her being tough. And I don't think that's because, I mean, it could be, but I don't think Alexandra kept it out. I think she was looking for that. I think she really wanted to find that. And there's certainly, there's certainly, there's one scene in which um, the speaker says to somebody she's on the phone with, um, you know, I was told you thought you would have a free vote. You must be thinking of some other speaker. There are no, there are no free votes. And then she sort of rants about that to, um, I can't remember whether it was Schumer she's ranting to or Hoyer or George Miller. I can't remember. But she says to somebody, like, can you believe this? Like, I thought there was a there were free votes. But um, there are two things that that struck me that were that were new. One is she's explaining to uh, her daughter. Basically, it's a negotiation. She's on the phone. She's on the phone throughout the whole movie like she has a phone glued to her hand the entire time and she says basically you can't get tired you can never get tired uh, and that that is just right on the like so that's exactly right and obviously for somebody who travels as much as she does raises as much money goes to as many candidate events as she does that's been the key for her and literally not getting tired the other thing is she in that um series where lawmakers are coming in to see her she just listens she um doesn't get tired of the listening part of the job um, and so can get people on board, not only by being tough on them, but also by hearing them out and um, taking that approach. I wrote down, John, 
uh, the the one line in my notes um, for this entire segment is you can never get tired. And I, that was exactly what stuck with me too, was that, that what, what she is, is she is this person who is incredibly persistent. She doesn't come across as being, she doesn't come across as being a scintillating speaker as being like the, you know, kind of absolutely brilliant person or anything like that. She just comes across as someone who's like incredibly hard working at this job and, and understands it profoundly and is working really hard at it. And that gets you like 98% of the way there. It was a revelation to me. I've never, I've had no opinion about Nancy Pelosi. I don't, I've never followed her. I've never really watched her speak. Like I don't, she's not someone who, who has any emotional hold over me. And I was utterly taken with her in this. Although I was kind of bored by the January 6th stuff. I think it's, I've just seen that now so many times and the emotional power of the January 6th stuff, to me, did, didn't come, A, because we've all seen it before, and also didn't come through as powerfully as Alexandra talking about it, which um, the reason she was there behind her mother with a camera so often, as she said in, in our interview, was that's that was family time. Like when there was a vote, uh, she invited the family down, so... Alexander was just always there at official events because that's when she saw her mom and that was true for her grandchildren as well. And she talks about during January 6th and even during the passage of healthcare, her kids saying to her, why do all these people want to kill Mimi, which is the name uh, that they give to their grandmother. Um, the, the first stage of the what Alexandra was going through is, you know, the the tonnage of Republican com commercials that were run against Nancy Pelosi, the turning of her into um, an absolutely evil boogie woman, um, which obviously has a, there's a gender component to that, but also she's, she is this figure first. And then they come to Capitol Hill. You could argue she was the most targeted person in the riot on January 6th. And to have that as the price of, of service um, and so Alexandra is kind of like, why do they hate her so much? And why do they? Um, and then, of course, the the attack on her father and the the snickering response to it by everybody from Elon Musk to um, to the governor of Virginia. What Alexandra is what wrestling with is, was any of this worth it? If that's the cost. One of the other things that struck me was that when Nancy Pelosi is in conversation with other people who are her peers, in some ways, like Vice President Pence or Speaker Paul Ryan at the time, she, for the most part, uses titles. Like there's no, it's you. You say, Mister Speaker. You don't, even though this is a guy, even this is Paul Ryan. She doesn't with Schumer, though. She doesn't with her like pal Schumer. I don't think, but she, but with 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 the Republicans, she absolutely did. She called Obama Mr. Mr. Yeah. President. Well, I guess with the president, I feel you have to do it. With I the guess president. everybody does that do with the president. president. I mean, but that sort of fits perfectly with a person with a, with someone who cares so much about that outward face. Um, I thought w one thing that was also a nice behind the scenes moment was where she's talking to Mark Meadows at the Trump White House, and it's clear what her feelings are about Donald Trump. There's no question about that. And and yet she's when she's negotiating with Meadows on whatever piece of legislation that was, it's not you know expletive laden. And you it could, you know what's happened to, in the scene is basically the Republicans are trying to sneak something into the legislation that would that would. Um, uh, be disapproved of by some of her members. And it's basically, look, what you're trying to do here is going too far. I just can't get you the votes. It's just incredibly businesslike and and calm. Of course, before she answers the phone, she says, I'll be cool as a cucumber. That kind of went off differently. I don't know what my total conclusion is, but it just sounded differently than I might have expected it to. I'm going to miss her. I, I I do love politics. I like the poli I like politicians who are good at being politicians. And she's so good at being a politician. Pelosi in the House on HBO. Check it out. It's really good. You can never get tired. Let's go to Cocktail Chatter. Um, if they made a movie about Emily Bazelon, would it be called Bazelon in the House? B Bazelon. Know, David, would it? <laughs> Bazelon on the porch? It would be called Bazelon it... with a drink in her hand that i like that one that's good um i am in philadelphia for an ideas festival put on by the philadelphia citizen which is a publication here and uh opening the festival um 
Larry Platt, who's the head of The Citizen, talked about something, John Dickerson, that made me think so much of you, which is that um, The Citizen is asking the mayoral candidates to answer questions as if they are going to have a job interview. Actually, first, they're starting by asking the people of Philadelphia to write a, a job description for mayor. And then they're going to make the mayoral candidates sit down and treat this as a job interview. And they, um, Larry said they had gotten the candidates to agree to annual performance evaluations and reviews if they are elected. So I just, this is just a page out of your book, man. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's the entire book, actually. It's every page in the book. It's the entire book, but, you know, um, it's adjusted from president to mayor. What if um, this turns out to be a total fiasco, John? Will you will you disavow your work? <laughs> My uh, slate reads is for December is with Gotham Makunda, who's written a book on picking presidents. And um, it's a more thought through idea about how you would try to pick different kinds of presidents. And and it's a good question, David. There, his one of his arguments is there are filtered and unfiltered presidents. Um, and one of the dangers of of a rigorous job interview, although I don't think he would really argue this, but yes, David, it's possible. You should a everybody should listen to that slate reads, but also yes, it's possible, David. You can you can sort of come up with a screening process that would screen out um, candidates who might be really um, skilled uh, because they have other things you just weren't successfully looking for. But my test would be perfect and therefore would capture all candidates. Right. Well said. John, what's your chatter? I was in Erie, Pennsylvania, um, which was a which was a joy um, speaking to the Jefferson Educational Society with um, Steve Scully. And one of the things we did was we looked through some um, uh, various moments in presidential history. And one that I had not lingered on as much as I should have was um, Nixon's speech when he le leaves the White House, August 9th, 1974. I, I knew about parts of it. This is the speech where he says, my mother was a saint. But you got to go watch it. Go to the millercenter.org at the University of Virginia um, and just watch the whole speech. It is, there's so much going on. I mean, it's a man unspooling in front of the camera. You know, he cracked and an, the office and misused it and abused his power it's, and on and on and on. But nevertheless, unlike Donald Trump, Nixon was also roiling with this desire to kind of perfect the presidency by all of its traditional norms. So he had all these – Richard Reeves' book begins beautifully on this day, August 9th, with all these notes Nixon wrote to himself about how he needed to work every day to lift the country's spirit. And you see that in this speech. He's on his way out and he's trying to inspire the young people in this clumsy, shambolic, emotional way – um, and then at the end, he, he says this line, which I'm not going to, to steal, but he basically, the advice he gives people is literally the thing that destroyed him. And it is this, you see in this speech, the two different Nixons. Um, I mean, you only see one in the speech, but you know what he's, why he has to leave because he didn't listen to any of the things. This one moment, it won't take you long. Um, and, and read Richard Reeves's book too, which is really good. My chatter, two two chatters, one very um, one very grim and one not at all grim. The very grim one is I would urge you to read the series that the Washington Post is doing about fentanyl. Uh, it's so sad and grim. It's a series of articles about fentanyl, how it gets here, uh, what its impact is, why it's so why it's so devastating. There's a I particularly recommend there's a piece by Kevin Seif, Salwan Georges, Aaron Patrick O'Connor, and Reka Tenharla about an addict in Tijuana and how this addict uh, lives. Uh, it's just so grim. And then there's an amazing story today, Thursday, about five people who died in Colorado earlier this year when they took what they thought was cocaine, but it turned out to be primarily fentanyl. And they all just like essentially died in an instant. Um, and they still don't know who supplied it to them or why. And it, it, this drug is, this drug is unspeakable. Um, and yet it is, uh, you know, we got to deal with it. So I would really recommend that in the post. The other thing I want to chatter about is just, uh, it's so trivial. The ever crisp apple. I don't know if you guys have, have discovered, discovered the ever crisp apple. It's a hybrid of the Fuji and the honey crisp. Hmm. That does seem promising. So it's not as sweet. 
No, it's sweet. It is sweet. It's very oh, crunchy it's really and it's sweet. I like a sweet, sweeter apple, but it has this fantastic texture. It's explosive, explosive, crunchy texture, but also a, a sweetness that I really like from the Fuji. So try it. The Evercrisp. And that's our show for today. The Gafest is produced by Shana Roth. Our researcher is Bridget Dunlap. Our mute theme music is by They Might Be Giants, who I am seeing play in D.C. tonight. Ben Richmond is Senior Director for Podcast Operations, and Alicia Montgomery is a VP of Audio for Slate. Please follow us on Twitter at Slate Gabfest. Tweet chatter to us there. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I am David Plotz. We will talk to you next week. Hello, Slate Plus. How are you? Good. So we have a conundrum show coming up at the end of the year. And one of the great things about our conundrums is that you send us so many and we can only ever get to a small fraction of the ones that are fascinating and interesting. And so we thought we would uh, do a Slate Plus today with some of the conundrums that we that caught our fancy. And um, maybe this will get you, it will get your salivary glands going for the prospect of, of conundrums uh, at the end of the year. So uh, I'll start with one. So from Shane Donahoe, what's the perfect time to get into a hot new thing, a fad or show or social media app? Is it right at the start when no one knows and you have to convince your friends to try it? Is it late once everyone's already there? Surely is a better point, but when is it? Well, if it's really going to be hot, then the beginning is amazing because then you were there first. I feel like I have accomplished this exactly one time in my life and it is this podcast. We started this podcast <laughs> yes. before podcasting was yes. a thing. Oh yes. my and God. I'm so glad. What an right. insight. You're what right. an right. insight. You're but right. for me, that is it. Because yeah. I am not a tastemaker, not an early adopter, oh and I God. always, I'm too insecure to play that role. It really, maybe the, the key was that it was with no forethought. Um, so uh, I guess my question is about w- one of these shows that people are always excited about is, um, if a tree falls in the forest, for, so in other words, if you are at the beginning of the fad, but all you do is enjoy the, the the new show yourself, is that what we're asking? Or are you the kind of person who likes to watch the new show and then talk to your friends and coworkers about the developments of the show as it unspools, right? Like didn't Slate used to have all of those, um, uh, like with Game of Thrones and other things where, where there were articles written and every time there was a new episode because people grooved on the kind of, a group. recap, I yeah. believe it is called, John. You're acting as if television culture is like this faraway country you've never visited. And well, I've never been in s- there. The I've game never been of the in thrones. Sync. I've never been in. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been in sync with one of these moments. I still, I, I, I haven't watched Mad Men. I, um, uh, all of these gr- programs that people are always psyched about. I mean, I did watch Game of Thrones. Um, so, yeah, you were even into Game of Thrones, so you have had. But you were this a super experience. early adopter of Twitter. I was an adopter of Twitter before, but yeah, before anybody was. But that was that was because it had a good, um, fu- it had good functionality when I was traveling in the in two thousand seven for the two thousand eight race. It was it was again stumbled completely into it. Um, it was just better than than Facebook was. But that's the best, right? If you're if you're there early and you get into it and figure the, out the thing. And then other people are interested. It's great. You that like, was just a snippet from our Slate like, Plus oh. conversation. If you want to hear the whole conversation, go to slate.com slash Plus to become a member today.